So before I start, uh, I would like to ask, like, uh, uh, is anyone there in the audience who has like experience with uh, event-driven architecture? Can you raise your hand? OK. Uh, so is there anyone uh, that have experience with UI development, especially with uh, JavaScript uh, kind of stuff? Yeah, so, so probably if you have worked with like most of the UI frameworks, you have already uh, worked with an uh, event-driven architecture. Uh, and if you know about the event-driven architecture, please uh, bear with me. Uh, because uh, I'll be talking about uh, like the basic principles uh, of the architecture. So uh, let's start uh, with uh, what is event-driven architecture. So this is the definition uh, uh, that is on Wikipedia. So it says event-driven architecture, or we call it as EDA, is a software architecture uh, pattern promoting the production, detection, uh, consumption of an uh, or an reaction to an events. So basically, when I read this, what I understood was uh, so basically it's something to do with events. So uh, let's take a look at uh, what is an event. So in like day-to-day uh, -day life, we came across like a lot of events which happen asynchronously. But in this case, uh, we need to understand uh, for a system uh, what an event is. So uh, one definition uh, that stand out is, uh, is event is a significant uh, change of state uh, in a system. So if you are familiar with the uh, UI development, uh, one of the common events that you would see is a button click. So when a user uh, interacts with a button and click it, the state of the button change, and because of that, uh, you uh, get notified uh, with an event. And uh, if you uh, think about it more abstract terms, uh, when it's come to like bigger systems, uh, let's say uh, it's an auction system, and uh, if a, a customer purchases a car, uh, from that system. So in that case, uh, the state of the car change inside the system. So the, the, that particular system uh, may recognize uh, that as an event. And these events uh, can be uh, represented uh, with object uh, or message. So if it's like uh, uh, limiting to a particular server and it's like a one application, probably it will be represented with an object. And if you are looking at like a distributed system, an event is probably uh, represented uh, by a message which get uh, passed around. And uh, another thing that happens uh, when an event occur is like the event notification. So basically, uh, when an event happens, that particular system will notify uh, to the other system saying uh, this event has occurred. So uh, let's have a look on event notification. So this is like the fundamental uh, 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 principle behind uh, event-driven architecture. Uh, so as I said, it happens when a system notifies other events uh, about a change in its uh, domain. Uh, one of the uh, attributes is like, uh, the, the source uh, of the system, uh, the source of the event, uh, doesn't care about a response receiving for the event that it produced. So basically, uh, it just uh, says to other system, this event has occurred, that's it. And uh, usually, uh, event can be like a simple thing as a, a, a string or text saying uh, this this is the uh, type of the event that occurred, or it can have uh, additional data uh, in the event itself for the receiving party to consume. And also, there's another case, like if the receiving party wants more data, it can always uh, communicate uh, to the sending party uh, and get, get that information. And uh, this, what this implies is, 
so there'll be like low level of coupling uh, between the system systems. So this is like a simple example. Uh, if you are, if you have worked with uh, UI stuff, so basically we uh, register a function for on-click event, and when the uh, event happens, uh, that particular function will get triggered. So let's uh, take a look at this in uh, enterprise application uh, domains. So to explain this, I'll take a simple example. So this is a system uh, uh, in an insurance company. And uh, there's a customer management system uh, and an insurance quoting system that calculates the premiums uh, of an insurance. And also, there'll be another uh, system for communication, sending out uh, mails and emails. So in this particular use case, let's say a user change uh, their address uh, uh, in the customer management system. So if you know about insurance, uh, changing uh, of address uh, will require you to like recalculate the premiums, because uh, based on where you live, uh, your premiums uh, will get changed. So if we are going to implement this uh, in a traditional uh, request response uh, architecture, uh, so basically what we would do is like uh, customer management will have to send a uh, uh, request uh, to the insurance quoting system saying uh, this particular address has changed, so uh, uh, do a, another calculation. And also insurance quoting system has to inform the communication system. So uh, what it does is uh, then the customer management system uh, has to know about the insurance quoting system, which is like not nice uh, because like a customer management system is usually a, a self-standing uh, system, and we don't want to uh, uh, create dependencies for other uh, system, uh, other like insurance quoting system in the customer management system. Also, it's like a, a major issue if you uh, if you are a uh, big company, uh, customer management system might be uh, maintained by different parties, uh, like different team, and insurance quoting system uh, will be maintained by another team. So if you want to introduce uh, these type of dependencies, you have to uh, have meetings, and like uh, uh, deployment of a such a change would be uh, costly. So, uh, what we would like to see uh, in this particular scenario is like, so as you know, custom management system doesn't depend on insurance quoting system. So we uh, let that particular system stand alone. And we can have a dependency from insurance quoting system to the custom management system. So basically, insurance quoting system will uh, talk to custom management system and get all the information that it needs. But uh, to implement this use case, uh, we need some way of communicating that an address has changed. In order to do that, uh, we can use an event. So basically here, uh, when the user uh, changes his address, custom management system will just trigger an event saying this particular user has changed his address. That's it. So custom management system doesn't care. Uh, about what other systems do uh, after that. So once uh, that is out, insurance quoting system will uh, subscribe uh, to the events. And once uh, he sees an address has changed, so basically, it will start the process of uh, doing a recalculation. And if he wants, uh, insurance quoting system can uh, talk to customer management system to get like other information of the customer uh, that is need for calculation. So here, there's like uh, some subtleties uh, you have to uh, uh, be worried. Uh, one is like events uh, versus commands. So uh, in the example I showed, custom management system says address has changed. So let's say instead of that, uh, custom management send out an event saying uh, uh, do a 
like saying recode. So in that case, we recognize that as a command instead of an event. So basically, uh, in a way, you're programming the flow of the particular process uh, into the events. So uh, if you do that, uh, you'll uh, lose out the flexibility uh, of the system. So always it's important to uh, make sure you like name the events properly uh, in your system. So once you have like a proper uh, event defined, the, the real advantage comes uh, uh, in when you want to uh, implement another system uh, which depend which needs to act on uh, the address chain, you can easily add those systems uh, uh, into your overall architecture. So as you know, like when you bring in this new system, uh, you don't have to do any changes to custom management system or insurance coating system. You can simply uh, add additional system into this architecture. So this uh, itself like gives a lot of uh, flexibility and extensibility uh, uh, in an event-driven architecture. So like I said, uh, the main uh, pro of uh, event-driven architecture uh, uh, is the receive and send is decoupled. And uh, you can uh, extend the system quite easily. And the, the downside uh, of this is uh, once you uh, have an event driven system, it's hard to tell uh, what a particular flow, flow would do unless you go in and like, actually uh, monitor what's happening in a system. So, in a traditional case, uh, you would have code in place that. Uh, that represent like the, the entire flow of a business process, but in this case, uh, uh, you won't be able to uh, see that. So what it means in term is like, it'll be like uh, kind of more difficult to debug uh, and to monitor the system. Uh, so basically you have to uh, use different approaches uh, in order to uh, debug and monitor. So I would like to introduce uh, you to another uh, pattern uh, that uh, is used uh, with the event-driven system. So it says uh, event-carried uh, state transfer. So in here, uh, uh, what happens is uh, custom management system uh, will have its own data store uh, about the customer. And uh, when an event is occurred, insurance coating system needs to uh, talk to custom management system. So, so basically, imagine like if there are more systems uh, that depends, uh, uh, like reacts to uh, address change, what will happen is uh, custom management system will get like a heavy load of requests to retrieve uh, information about the customer. So basically, uh, what if uh, we can uh, get rid of uh, this uh, request uh, going to the custom management system? So basically, what we have to do is, uh, in the event, uh, we can have like all the information about the customer uh, that the uh, other systems require. So basically, other system uh, will have their own data store uh, about the customer. So, so uh, and basically, like, uh, it doesn't have to cre uh, uh, keep, like, all the custom information. He, it can uh, specifically ke keep the, uh, uh, the customer, like, the attributes uh, that particular process needs. So what this does is uh, it will, like, significantly reduce the overall load uh, in the system. Uh, for the custom management system. And also, uh, the other system would be able to operate uh, uh, if the customer management system, even if the custom management system is down. 
So that's like a good attribute to have, like better resiliency uh, for faults uh, in the system. So as I said, uh, event carry uh, state transfer will give you like uh, more decoupled uh, systems and uh, overall uh, reduce the load on the sender and it will give you more resiliency, which is like a really good uh, 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 attribute to have in a system. But the, the, on the other hand, what you, uh, the trade-off is, like it's replicated data, so there'll be inconsistencies, and so it'll be uh, in a model where like, uh, it, it'll be like an eventual consistency system, and the complexity of the receiver uh, will also get increased because uh, you have to manage all that data uh, inside the, the subsystem. Okay. So uh, now let's uh, have a look on uh, what is a reactive app. Uh, so basically, react. Uh, application uh, has like uh, these four uh, main components. Uh, basically, uh, it's a responsive uh, system uh, and also which is resilient and scalable. So uh, the question is like, why do you want to build uh, uh, reactive applications? So uh, if you were in the uh, keynotes yesterday, you would realize like the the requirements of the applications are like number of users are getting really high uh, uh, the number of users the systems has really with is getting high and also it is very important uh, the applications that you build are to be responsive so in uh, today's world when we use like a lot of apps we want like instant feedback and instant response uh, for the actions we perform. So having a, a really good responsive app uh, will promote your business uh, uh, in the world. So that's why uh, it's important to have a reactive application. So uh, if we look at uh, the responsiveness, uh, it's basically uh, build on resiliency and scalability, right? So if you can't uh, scale your app uh, with the user demands, then that means uh, your responsiveness uh, will get uh, hit. And also, you, your apps should be able to like uh, uh, withstand failures and uh, provide proper responsive uh, feedback to the user. So that will uh, create a better experience for the user and uh, users so that users will uh, stay with your business. So, uh, and all this like responsiveness, uh, resiliency and scalability is achieved in a, a reactive app by using a, a message driven architecture. So, uh, when you talk about a message driven architecture, so basically uh, there's like uh, two categories. Uh, one is uh, event driven and other one is the actor based one. So in this case, uh, I find like the event driven is more attractive. Uh, and if you compare the actor based one, so basically what happens is like instead of an event, uh, a particular system will do a uh, direct uh, command uh, to another system uh, saying uh, do this particular uh, work. So uh, if you look at uh, in an event-based system, we already talk about like how easy it is to scale and how easy it is to uh, add new features. And also uh, uh, if you uh, uh, look at the uh, event-driven state transfer, you'll see like how uh, well you can uh, make your application resilient. Right. 
So the next question is, uh, how do you implement uh, such a system uh, in an enterprise? So this is like a, a high-level uh, uh, diagram of an event-driven uh, system. So basically, you have like uh, multiple systems which uh, produce and consumes events. And we have a special uh, uh, component called event channel. So basically, uh, that's act as a uh, event bus where like other systems subscribe uh, to events. As you can see, like uh, some systems might only uh, produce events, and some might only consume events, and there can be system uh, where both can happen. And another thing uh, often you would need is like uh, analytics. Uh, uh, and uh, also we see like these days a lot of people uh, couple uh, complex event process uh, into their uh, event-driven architectures. So the analytics you require because like I said, unless you have like a clear view on what's going on real time, it's hard to see uh, how your system acts. So analytics and where you uh, analyze the uh, system is very important. And uh, the, the complex event processor, by coupling a complex event processor, you get like additional advantage where you can uh, do other, uh, like produce other events based on the existing events. So this would be like a technology map uh, uh, onto the architecture. So basically, uh, it's important to have like a message broker as the event channel because like in a distributed system always something can go wrong so uh, because of that you need to have like a re reliable communication uh, for the event channel so like one option is like wso2 message broker and also like a lot of people use uh, apache kafka uh, as the event channel and the systems, uh, them of course, can be uh, in any programming language. And basically, you can use uh, Kubernetes or Docker uh, to scale out uh, these systems quite easily. OK, so the next question is like, do I have to re-architect, uh, uh, rewrite like all the systems that I have? in order to get benefits, uh, benefit out of event-driven architecture. So usually, uh, that's not the case. So let's say you have like a, a leg legacy monolith application. What you can do is you can put an agent uh, that produce uh, events uh, out to an event channel. And you can have like different subsystems to act on it. So this is like a, a good way of like uh, uh, saving money, let's say you have like a very complex ERP and you want to add in like additional uh, uh, system to uh, do some work. So instead of like sending a chain request or uh, changing like uh, monolith code, it might be uh, simpler and cost effective to open up a event channel and get event stream and build your additional capabilities uh, implemented as uh, other subsystems. So uh, this will like uh, will be also a way of like transitioning from a uh, legacy monolith application uh, to an event-driven architecture. And also like uh, if you have like a service-oriented architecture in place, uh, another thing you could do is. Uh, as like to react to events, uh, uh, you can uh, invoke services uh, once an event happens. Uh, that again uh, is like uh, event-driven architecture kind of complements uh, the software-oriented architecture. And uh, Amila already mentioned about uh, event-driven architecture in serverless. 
So this is becoming like uh, really uh, uh, trending now because like uh, if you uh, look at the event handlers uh, in event driven architecture, so basically they are like a concentrated set of business logic, right? So which can be easily uh, implemented uh, as uh, functions in a serverless architecture. And if you have like these uh, functions with different business logic in place, uh, it's like a more natural uh, for you to use an event-driven architecture uh, to use these functions to uh, interact and uh, do complex tasks. Uh, and again, like it'll be managed by uh, third parties, so the management cost will be real less. So this is uh, becoming a really attractive now. So I would like to end. Uh, uh, end of the day, wind-driven architecture is architecture, not a solution. So it's like how you look at your problems uh, in your business and to see like uh, what are the benefits uh, of the wind-driven architecture offers and how you uh, map those uh, and uh, into solving your problems. So uh, I would recommend you to uh, read this. It's uh, by Martin Fowler. Uh, so he has like a lot of uh, like some patterns related to event-driven uh, architecture. So it was a good read. Uh, thank you.